this has been a very productive afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being uh, present for this uh, last uh, question and answer session uh, in the third uh, virtual symposium for acute flux in my life. Is. So we are very excited and actually uh, listening the presentations that you gave to us is quite amazing that we have uh, advanced in diagnosis, even on vaccines and the treatment and learning what is being done with organoids and learning about genetics. But I'm going to actually ask uh, Christina and Matt first. Christina, the fact that the NIH is moving with uh, this vaccine and the phase one is quite exciting. I, I was very surprised to hear about that. So, um, I mean, in the, in the future for uh, vaccines, I think that the, uh, what we have learned with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is, uh, is, is, uh, is very amazing in the last few, few months. So I hope that that is going to help us to develop a very quick approach to enterovirus D6TA and AFM. Do you like to expand a little bit about the view that you have and your team has for moving forward quickly with the vaccine and, and the approach for acute uh, flux in my life? Thank you, Carlos. So um, as many of you know, our director is uh, taking a lot of interest in AFM and uh, he was super active before the, this new pandemic happened. <laughs> he, he was really actively uh, pushing us to get to advance the field of uh, AFM and uh, and trying to uh, accelerate the development of countermeasures. Um, we were really waiting to figure out what was the what were the causes of AFM, and we still don't know the full picture as it was discussed earlier. But at least we know that one of the viruses is probably involved that this is EVD68. So we started to work on these one vaccines for this one pathogen. But of course, so as we learn more, we might need to make a broadly protective enterovirus vaccine. We are completely cognizant of that. So we're going to start doing, and there is some work in this direction already from our VRC group and others in trying to map epitopes in these uh, enteroviruses that are co in common and trying to figure out a way to make a vaccine that might be able to protect against a variety of uh, enteroviruses, uh, because I think that would, might be a better solution than keep chasing these new enteroviruses as, as they come and cause outbreaks. Um, it starts with one as a proof of concept, which is what we're doing with EVD68. There is a lot of work ahead of us, like uh, we have to improve the animal models so we can use them for testing these vaccines. And it's still a little bit unclear on how we might be able to test this in the field uh, since the outbreaks are so sporadic and so difficult to, to catch to prove efficacy. So we're going to need everybody's input and to figure out, okay, great, we're going to have a vaccine probably uh, in the next year or two, but how, and we can easily do a phase one, of course, but how do we show that it actually works to prevent uh, AFM? Thank you, Christina. Uh, uh Matt, that is a fantastic work, and uh, it's quite amazing to have something ready to go. Uh, I heard uh, that basically you, a couple of days ago, you had um, uh, experiment uh, evidence that uh, this is in humans is, is going to actually go to generate a, a good response. But in your view, what would be the logistic? I mean, let's say yeah. in every other year we are having between 300 cases, 500 cases. What would be the logistic uh, for having this treatment approach very handily to uh, healthcare providers? Because uh, obviously uh, you are basically using a technology as a high uh, technology, but the important part is just to move very quickly to have this in, in the uh, healthcare uh, setting. So what is your view on the logistic? How is that uh, coming along? So, so let me give you uh, my ideal world pie in the sky, and then let me give you what probably is a little more realistic. Um, I think we all agree that really the best case scenario is pre-existing immunity, right? So if we can vaccinate everybody, we know we have a good vaccine, uh, that works great. It's hard to evaluate that, but um, you know, the cost of monoclonal antibodies is going down 
And I will tell you, I drink the human monoclonal antibody Kool-Aid because I'm in a human monoclonal antibody lab. So that's a disclosure I feel like I should give here. But, um, you know, there, there's really, there's uh, efforts by people like Gates Foundation and others to really try to drive the cost of a human monoclonal antibody. I think the goal that my mentor, Jim Crow, talks about is, you know, getting a $1 a dose antibody. Um, and so what you could do is while you're waiting on a vaccine to be developed, if you don't know that you have one right off the bat, um, you could immunoprophylax populations. And I think that our population to immunoprophylax is pretty clear. Um, it's probably kiddos uh, in their first, you know, half year of life to school age. So, you know, that's a world where that's cost feasible. We're, we don't live in that world right now. And I, and I know that that's where we're at right now. So, you know, when we had envisioned how would we potentially use this antibody in humans, uh, Ken Tyler said it very well the first time, uh, the, the, the last of one of these little sessions, which is you got to do it as soon as possible. And this is where human monoclonal antibodies have a great advantage. These things are super duper safe. Now, I say that because we've given a lot of human mono, we've given a lot of humanized monoclonal antibodies, and we're just starting to finally give a lot of human monoclonal antibodies. So Ebola is a case where this has actually been done. Um, there's other infections where this is finally being done, and there's a lot of these in line. And you. Uh, Bet your, bet your bottom dollar that uh, coronavirus, there's a lot of these out there, hundreds of millions of dollars going into this and in development of human monoclonal antibodies. So I think um, what the advantage of the technology we just, that I use for this particular experiment is that we got our antibodies from memory B cells. So these are B cells that have been affinity matured and have lasted in, in this particular case, three years after we know these patients were infected with their virus. So these antibodies are not autoreactive antibodies. These are antibodies that the body has, through whatever means it has, selected to be good antibodies to hang on to these memory cells. They've been affinity matured, and they're not giving these kids autoimmune diseases and things like that. Um, that's a major advantage of using the memory B cell approach uh, and this human hybridoma approach. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't go through all the steps of you know, formally making sure these don't bind to human tissues and tissue cross-reactivity panels and things like that. But it gives us a chance to, if, if we have these antibodies stationed in hospitals, especially if we know that outbreaks are coming and a kid walks in with some limb weakness, hit them with the antibody now and don't wait to see that they have intervars D68. Don't wait to see if they have their weakness progress because it's a pretty darn safe thing to do. Um, it's IVIG, except it's just one IG. There's, there's not you know million, thousands to millions of IGs. Um, and then I also agree with nearly what everybody else said is it's probably not the answer to just give an antibody. The answer is probably give an antibody, give an anti-inflammatory of some sort. So if Charles and his people can tell us what are the uh, inflammatory signatures that are, you know, going up, maybe we don't have to give steroids. Maybe we can give a, you know, tocilizumab or baricitinib or, you know, all these lessons we're kind of learning from coronavirus. Maybe we can apply a more selective immune pressure. Um, and then also if we can have an antiviral, um, because the antibodies may not get into the spinal fluid, but what they are going to do pretty clearly is no more virus is circulating in these people. So if we can at least really effectively chop off any virus that's anywhere else, get an antiviral in there, any infected cell to stop the replication and the, you know, interfere with the proteases or, or the replication machinery and calm down the immune system. Um, you know, I think something like that would be uh, potentially pretty good. Thank you, Matt. Actually, uh, that actually bring me to ask Charles about uh, hearing your presentation on CRISP and the potential of CRISP for very rapid diagnosis. It's fascinating, but we have all of this technology in our, our university center. How would be the logistic for moving that very quickly to uh, points of care and, and basically that everybody has access to these small uh, uh, machines that can detect uh, in 40 minutes, 50 minutes, if we have a patient with enterovirus. Is that technology going to be available soon? Give us a view about that transition from high, highly sophisticated institutions to points of care. Sure, I, I'd be happy to. So um, I, I think that in some respects, the COVID-19 pandemic has really spurred kind of development of diagnostic testing. And, and not only that, but in terms of making uh, 
microbial or microbiological diagnostic testing widely available. I, I think that it quick. I, I think that the reason the pandemic has really uncovered the fact that we simply were unprepared for a novel pathogen. We simply did not have testing capability, um, even even traditional testing capability in, in laboratories. And so. Um, um, on, on the other hand, um, I, I think that we, we are able to leverage the fact that, that there's been so much support for rapid test development for COVID-19. Uh, for, for instance, um, the, um, there re recently, uh, just a few weeks ago, was actually the first ever you know, CRISPR-based assay was actually EUA approved by the FDA. And so this was, um, you know, I went back to literature, this was the first ever kind of the use of a CRISPR-based assay. I anticipate that our CRISPR-based assay will also be approved probably within the next week. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it really gives you a blueprint uh, for not only targeting, say, SARS coronavirus 2 in this case, but targeting pretty much any virus. And, and getting back to also what, uh, you know, what Matthew commented on, uh, you, you, do, you don't necessarily have to target just the virus. We could also target, for instance, the inflammatory genes or the you can target the human host genes or biomarkers that may help either predict outcome or may help diagnose the disease. Um, so what I anticipate, the major challenge right now is not in the technology. I think the major challenge right now is in sort of getting past kind of the traditional regulatory barriers and making this type of technology available for say testing at home or testing in point of care settings, such as emergency department and urgent care clinics. And so that still is a challenge, although um, I think that, uh, you know, especially given that the FDA has, has really, um, relax a lot of their traditional restrictions in the in the, given that it, you know covid-19 was clearly a public health need arguably um, you know the same paradigm could be used for developing point of care and validating point of care uh, diagnostics very rapidly thank you so much charles um, uh, priya it's you may have a little bit of the secret key to understand afm and its genetics because it's very clear that families get affected, all the family, parents, kids get affected by enterovirus and only one get the hit in the spinal cord. So I would basically ask the question to you in the same, same way as I ask uh, Charles is how we can make sure that we understand, we are going to understand the genetics of this in the next couple of years after you get and accumulate, accumulate all of that data that you are building up but how we are going to translate that for patient care? How can we move in that direction? Is this part of the precision medicine as uh, Anne mentioned? What, what is your view about that? Yeah, um, great question, Carlos. I think a couple of different places, um, and it will really depend on what we learn. Um, one is the potential for screening. So one common question of family members is, I have one child who has AFM, you know, what's the risk to my other child? And that's a really tough one. You know, right now, other children haven't been infected, um, sorry, affected, but we don't know what the other what their other children will see. And, and I think that's where the polio literature is really fascinating because you do see that it occurs even in separate outbreaks. So one is screening, and then the other is potential drug targets. Um, you know, I mean, I think that if we have a vaccine, it will be wonderful and, and we can stop things in its track. But if we don't, it will give us a lot of information about where we should be targeting things. And I think working with data that Matthew and Charles and others will have will really help us um, to speed things along. We're just at a different place right now in terms of technology. We just need to figure out some of these pieces before we can move there. And, Car Actually, and Carlos, playing off, uh, you know, Priya brought up a good point. If you can predict who's at higher risk to get AFM and it's really expensive to give antibody immunoprophylaxis, well, now we can narrow from every child to the kids who are at high risk, the way we do with RSV. I mean, that's why we only give RSV immunoprophylaxis to certain populations, right? It's pretty expensive to do. Yeah. So we hit the, the highest likelihood. Yeah, I agree entirely. Um, you know, if you look at, you know, we, we're, we've all been thinking about these kids for quite a long time now. And there is just a small proportion of kids that does poorly. And not only is there a small proportion of kids that does poorly, but within that group of kids, we found that half of the kids actually do okay and half do terribly. And, and so if you can predict the ones that are going to do that are going to do terribly and can target um, something, that would be the key, right? 
because I, I don't even know, um, just like with our so-called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, I don't even know if our steroids and all of that make a difference in outcome, right? You know, they, they may get better more quickly. Sometimes they start turning around, you give them steroids and they, uh, and they, they get better. <laughs> and everybody thinks that you're, it may be that they were just getting better. Um, just, you know, as, um, as we discussed that A71 group that just got better, you know, how do we predict that? Maybe Charles can so, help us. <laughs> there is one thing that uh, is uh, fascinating, and I think that uh, Matt mentioned this uh, briefly, is we, we, we may need to have a cocktail, <laughs> a cocktail that includes a vaccine, and a cocktail that includes an antiviral, and a cocktail that may include even the antibodies, and then just start it in that way. But again, that is going to be a lot of logistics for the future and, and getting all of this comprehensive approach is going to be challenging. But, uh, uh, and you're a clinician working on the front lines with patients with acute neurological uh, uh, problems. So in your view, what would be the practical approach to deal with these issues when we are dealing with this complex disease that are very aggressive, fulminant, and how it will be the best uh, dream for a clinical neurologist working with these children to accomplish a good, successful uh, treatment? Well, you know, I, I think that that's, uh, that's the million dollar question or the $64 million question, isn't it, Carlos? Um, there's a little side conversation going if anyone has their chat open um, about, um, you know, about maybe we should target these all like Kawasaki's, you know, give the IVIG uh, because of the experimental models that suggest the uh, utility of IVIG. Um, you know, I, I think that for a clinician with today's knowledge right now, um, aggressive um, immunosuppressive therapy is, is really the bottom line, whichever form that you might use. I, I don't know that, um, I don't know that we, we know which form is the best, even though, you know, IVIG uh, seems to have risen to the top within the animal models, but I don't know if we know the answer. Um, you know, no one has really looked at uh, how, how quickly you can drive cytokines down and the inflammatory cascade down with plasmapheresis versus IVIG. Um, we do a lot of plasmapheresis and uh, we certainly have cleaned out some kids that had bad, um, bad sort of cytokine storm type type syn syndromes um, very quickly with plasmapheresis and where it wouldn't occur so quickly with IVIG. So I don't know the answer, um, but I do think we should be aggressive. I don't think that we should just admire. Great. So Christina, uh, we heard about vaccines and we also heard about development of antibodies and, and other things. And, and uh, we um, are very, eager to get involved in all of this study, but what is going to be your message uh, for families of patients with AFM about the future of research and why is the importance of participating in all of the research efforts that we are putting together for understanding AFM? So uh, I guess the message is that our institute and our ECU director especially really care about AFM and uh, we're really trying to do our best to push, continue pushing <laughs> these, uh, the development of these vaccines and therapeutics as much as we can, considering all the other priorities right now for with, the, with the outbreak of the current uh, pandemic. Um, it's only if families get involved and participate to these trials, uh, we will we'll be able to uh, evaluate these, these, these interventions and, and see if they're safe and they're effective. So we're going to need a partnership between the government, academia, companies. They're going to need to be involved in, in manufacturing this and, of course, the families uh, all, all, and, and to participate to the trials. So it's going to take uh, a village. So, Matt, you are dealing with a lot of infectious disorders in your pediatric practice, and you mentioned RSV, that is also a very important respiratory virus. But uh, with the use of uh, your technology and approaches, uh, uh, what do you want families to understand uh, the concept of a research trial or a phase one or phase two trial. Um, this is important because there are many in the audience that are parents 
And when we come with something that is new, like a, a new antibody, uh, we don't know what is the reaction that families are going to have. Do you mind to explain in your own words for a family member of a patient with AFM? Absolutely. What do you like to accomplish? Absolutely. So first off, just quickly, the difference between the phase one trial and the phase two trial is pretty key. A phase one trial is just putting a new therapeutic into a, a very small, very small, like eight to 10 number of humans. Uh, it doesn't have to be any human that might have a disease that you're interested in. It's just, can I give this to a healthy human and do they remain healthy? Um, so that is something that uh, we are hopeful to be able to be doing in in that most optimistic scenario, let's say the next couple of months. Um, phase two is where you start to try to give um, an experimental therapy to folks who are either likely to have a disease or may actually have a condition or a disease. It's where you can actually really start to look at efficacy. They're usually a little smaller numbers in phase three is where, and, and I should say in phase two, you might kind of, everybody might know who is sick and who isn't sick. In phase three is where you might get a chance to really start randomizing and you know, either you don't know who's sick or not, or they don't know what treatment they're getting and you don't know what treatment they're getting. And that's sort of like a gold standard where we can really stand back and say, we know that what we did worked well in this study. Um, what a lot of us have been talking about uh, and maybe just not saying very expressly is that those studies are hard to do when it's a disease that only affects very few people. That phase three, that gold standard study, it's very hard to do when it's a rare condition. And as we've talked about AFM, on the scale of studies is a rare condition. Now it's, you know, in the United States, we had 230 kids uh, with a polio-like paralyzing illness. So I don't think any of us take it lightly. Uh, Dr. Fauci's not taking it lightly and none of us do. Um, but it's just, it's more speaking from the practicalities of how to generate data in a way that we can really know exactly what we're talking about. So, so this makes it tough. Um, but what I would say is if someone is approached about, uh, hey, we have this potential therapeutic, this antibody thing, um, you know, which would be our antibody or someone else's antibody. I mean, but, but just any potential therapeutic. Um, one, be encouraged that someone's asking you to do this in a study, because that's key. When we try to just, I think what we've learned in a big way from coronavirus, but what we also learned when we tried to do this with fluoxetine um, or Prozac in NRC 68 is if it's not done in a prospectively studied way, it's very, very hard to understand if we made any difference with our therapies. Um, so if you're a parent, be encouraged that someone's doing this in a prospectively studied way. By prospectively studied, I mean, they're approaching you at the front end and saying, we wanna give a therapy and understand what happens when we give this therapy. Um, as opposed to asking you after the fact, hey, what are the therapies that you had? And do you feel better? Um, it's just better to do it on the front end. Um, so that's encouraging. And then too, what I said about the human monoclonal antibodies, um, and especially the, the way that our antibodies were generated um, is they were generated by a, a natural infection with the virus in a patient who just had a cold, uh, a patient who did not have uh, AFM and they recovered from their cold and they got better. Um, and then years later, they still are making these antibodies. And so this is what we would wanna do with a vaccine. This is what we hope that Dr. Cassetti and, and all her folks, all her colleagues at the NIH can, can do one day is give us a vaccine so our, our, our bodies are naturally making these antibodies. We're sort of skipping the vaccine step and we're saying, I just wanna give you this antibody now so that you have it. You don't need to, there's no lag time between giving you the vaccination and then your body generating an immune response or you getting the virus infection in your nose, your body generates an immune response, but it lags a couple of days. We wanna give you that immune response now. Um, and that's what we would be doing with this antibody. And we have seen them to be very, very safe when they're isolated in this method coming out of memory B cells where the human body already screens for antibodies that may be, you know, not quite the right antibodies, like that the human body has said, these are the antibodies that work that keep this virus at bay. Um, of course, there's always imperfections in how, in how we try to find these antibodies. But I think in my mind, this is one of the safest ways to figure out what is that individual part and in, that's floating around in the bloodstream that is really gonna be effective at, at getting, you know, at killing this virus. Great, thank you, Matt. So I'm going to ask a very generic question, and I have asked the same to my previous colleagues in previous sessions, is as a AFM researcher scientist, what is your dream for the next 
year. And what is the main message for the families when they encounter with the AFM? So Priya, you start with the, <laughs> your view. Yes. What is your dream and what is your message? Um, so it's been six years, right, since we've been studying this. So my dream is, from my perspective, is that we figure out the genetics behind this. Um, and it's not for a lack of effort. It's uh, really just time. We need time and we need samples. So we cannot thank enough the families that work with us and the physicians and researchers across the country that work with us. So, um, you know, please keep working with us. Uh, we'll keep doing what we can do and hopefully we'll see something in a year. Um, we really are on the side of the families. I think everyone here is, and, and you put that forefront, right at the front, Carlos, of how important mm -hmm. the families are to us um, and how much when we see those kids, you think of your own, right? You think of who's affected. And so my message is we're here with you. We're gonna do our best and we're gonna keep working at this until we have a solution. Great, thank you so much, Priya. And what is your dream? My dream? What is your message? Uh, my message is, um, um, my dream is that we were able to um, develop adequate predictive power and adequate collaboration harmonization so that we can figure out and um, treat in a, um, in a safe way um, these children. Um, so that our outcomes continue to improve. We saw improvements between 2014 and 2018, probably due entirely to um, early recognition, um, coordinated um, referral, like things that you don't think about. People telling us that they were coming, treating early on, believing that, um, that something would help the children. Um, so in the next year, I hope that we're even more aware and that we are able to prevent even more disability. Thank you, Anne. Christina. So I, I hope that in the next year, we'll get a much better understanding on the pathophysiology of this disease and really understand what makes these children sick. Because I think that's the foundation for really understand how to best treat them. Uh, for example, if it's in a more of an immune mediated uh, phenomena, that you can lean toward treating them with the, some sort of anti-inflammatory. If it's more a direct damage from the viral infection, then we should really shift um, most of our focus in, uh, in pushing for these antivirals that are safe and they can cross the, uh, they, they can reach the, the CNS. So ultimately it would be nice to have some tools in the hospital that we can use as soon as some children uh, develop disease. Charles. Yeah, my, my hope is in the development of diagnostic biomarkers because this is a this is basically something that faces us all of the time in, in infectious diseases. Why is it that the same virus has such different clinical effect in different patients? I mean, this is true for not only um, enterovirus D68, but West Nile virus. Um, you can think of even SARS coronavirus too. Why is it that some people get very sick and some people don't? And I really think that it, 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 it's, it's going to be the host. So uh, what I hope for in the next couple of months is that we will really identify what are the host biomarkers, at least that are actively being expressed in response to infection, so that we can use those to develop better diagnostics, but also perhaps to target them for uh, therapies. Thank you, Charles. Matt? Well, putting me last, uh, everybody took all the good answers, but uh, so I agree with everybody else. But what I will say is um, I hope that the social distancing measures that are undergoing right now actually delay this outbreak that we all kind of are planning on having. Um, and at least the early signals I've seen from, I think it was um, Janelle Routh's talk the first day she was showing, I mean, the signals have remained like super, super low, but the, but the signals are already low anyway at baseline. So the idea is, I mean, we may not have an AFM outbreak that we thought we were gonna have this year. And in my mind, that gives me an extra year to get this thing into trials. That gives Dr. Cassetti and the Vaccine Research Center and everybody else who's making vaccines, they're not the only ones. I mean, there's a lot of people making vaccines. That gives everybody an extra year to try to get all this stuff up and running. And, cause I do think it's what Dr. Ye said, people, if they can recognize this early and if we can have something we can do quickly, um, I mean, that just seems to help so much. And I think that people like Dr. Pardo and the whole 
AFM Working Group have really done a good job. I mean, the CDC has definitely done this, NIH has done this, you know, spreading the word so that I think lots of frontline pediatricians, I mean, the really, it's it, honestly, it's the frontline pediatricians and their clinics when the families yeah. give them a phone call. It's the frontline pediatricians in the ED. These are the people who have the potential to make the most benefit right now. Because I think I'm in Dr. Ye's camp. I'm not really sure anything we're doing at the moment is honestly helping all that much. I hope it is, but I am not totally convinced that it is. Um, but I do think that the early recognition, getting these kids to tertiary care medical centers if they need to be intubated, getting aggressive physical therapy right off the bat, that sort of stuff. I mean, that's what we do know seems to help. And so let's get that going as soon as possible. Fantastic. Well, thank you all of you for uh, this terrific uh, lecture this afternoon and for the work that you are doing for the AFM community. We really appreciate your time and dedication. And for the participants in this uh, symposium, I know that it's late. It, this was a very nice uh, run of, uh, um, uh, of lectures and a good marathon. And we are at the end of the marathon today. I'd like to invite you to participate next Friday in our uh, uh, virtual session. It's going to be the fourth one that is going to be dedicated to aspects related with rehabilitation and management. Uh, if you haven't registered for that, please register and we will see you next week. And thank you. Enjoy your weekend and thank you so much for your time and everything. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Carlos.